Michael Pacino and I'll be facilitating this panel this afternoon. Thank you so much for choosing us over the other stream that was running over there that <laughs> clearly is not as good as ours. Um, I'm joined, I, oh, I head up the blockchain and fintech practice at Piper Alderman out of Sydney uh, and I'm joined today by Tobias Crush who um, comes from the accounting world, in fact, disclaimer alert, uh, used to be part of Piper Alderman but he left us, we were very sad, to co-found <laughs> Willbits um, and recently pitched at Alticon, and it's a Wills um, blockchain startup. So it's looking to transform the way Wills are stored and shared facing um, off blockchain technology. So Tobias brings a passion for trying to bring easy-to-use technology to life. I wish he'd stayed at, in a law mm. firm to help make that come true <laughs> for us. Um, but also really focusing on the end users. So he'll be bringing us a really good in, insight from that startup world, but also coming up from the uh, recovering law firm world. And <laughs> in that vein, another rec a re recovering lawyer. Uh, <laughs> Steve is a qualified lawyer, but now a blockchain technology and digital strategist. Um, he, how, how do you split your time between Honey Digital and Blockchain APAC? Well, I, I, a lot of the conversation around blockchain is, uh, blockchain is saying no to things. And the digital stuff is saying yes to problems that people don't need to visibly see me doing. So I solve problems in one, and I tell stories in the other. <laughs> So that's kind of similar to the practice of law then, just yes. saying. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, he's also a mentor in the Melbourne University Accelerator Program. And how much of that is involving blockchain? Uh, not a huge amount, but across all the sort of the conversations now sort of intersect. I think the evolution now means that if you're talking IoT, you're probably talking blockchain. If you're talking uh, supply chain, you're talking blockchain. So everyone's figuring out it's a hub and spoke sort of uh, interaction. Fantastic. And yeah. Peter Singh joined us from KPMG. Um, he's a senior technology and innovation manager. Uh, working on strategy design and delivery of automation projects for high growth and large multinationals. Now he helped work on the KPMG crypto tax estimator for Independent Reserve, who disclaimer is one of my clients, um, and that's a fantastic step being taken for tax compliance, because uh, as many of you may know in the room, there's slight issues with people not reporting <laughs> crypto gains. Um, he's also the co-founder of Transhumanism Australia. How much <laughs> robot are you? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> all, uh, these are all, what you see is what you get, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you're also an executive member of the Science Party, which is dedicated to helping government decisions be based on science instead of how they're usually based. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Allegedly. 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 <laughs> now, usually at this point we say turn your phones off, but as you may have seen from the clue on the screens, I like to take a gauge of the room, and hands in the air is really old school for asking questions, plus then we forget. This way we can see what's happened and tailor our approaches to you guys. So do take your phones out, please, because I would um, like to get you to answer some questions very quickly. So if you go to this page, menti.com, wait, Peter, are you making sure it works? Yeah. St stacking the answers. I'm skew the votes a little bit. <laughs> Best presenter, Peter. Um, <laughs> So is that working for everyone? Uh, so then it should ask you for a little code, and then that should let you in. Um, and then I'll just go through a few questions quickly, the first one of which will be just gauging the level of blockchain knowledge in the room. And I, think, I think across this, Michael and I were speaking before, I've been, this is going to sound terribly sad, I've been in more than 200 rooms in the last two years talking blockchain. There are no dumb questions in those rooms. Uh, the reality is people don't understand the space. So if you, uh, if you don't understand, you've got a general query, all questions have some sense in the context in which you ask. So <laughs> make sure that everyone asks questions. So I count about 25 people in the room, so we can call it around 20, because there's one or two people who never want to take part. Wow, two people are in CryptoKitties. <laughs> That's awesome. They are a real thing. Does anyone not know what crypto kitties are? Yeah. They're a great little crypto collectible, like an online trading thing. The most expensive one, I think, traded for 130,000 US, yeah. but most of them are much cheaper than that. And when I showed my daughter one, she looked at it and went, oh, it's so cute. What does it do? And I said, that doesn't really do anything. <laughs> <laughs> she sits there and looks cute. But it's, um, it, was, it was actually a little experiment someone made on the Ethereum blockchain just to say, oh, you could make a digital collectible that no one could sort of copy and paste the same one and it got wildly successful and almost crashed the network. And still to this day, a lot of people get very obsessive about their little collectible crypto kitties. <laughs> All right, well, that, about 20 is pretty good. So that's pretty good. We have elementary, my dear Watson, um, none, a couple, an intermediate person, and a couple of people who are in the crypto kitties, one of which is possibly Peter. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I just want to get an idea about what people think 
the impact of blockchain will be on their legal practice. You have the options of none, it's all a scam. No more than the internet or email did. We will all be out of a job soon or don't care, I'll be retired. Which is a legitimate <laughs> answer that I've heard from some people. <laughs> Whoever did that, is that actually serious or are you just being a uh, smart aleck? Is you? <laughs> so this is my wife Leanne, so she, she's supposed to ask some clever questions. It's actually, it's actually our wedding anniversary today, our 11th oh. anniversary, so we can give her a round of applause for being amazing. <laughs> How else would you want to spend your wedding anniversary? <laughs> hearing your partner speak and facilitate. He is, he is a keeper. He's definitely <laughs> So clearly someone got in early on crypto kitties and we were retiring soon with their $100,000 kitties. Uh, and everyone else thinks I tend to agree with the no more than internet and email, which is probably a great deal. Um, next, just a quick test of how many people have seen blockchain pop up in your matters or work. I think on the crypto kitties issue as well, just to sort of connect dots and how quickly these things move, it seems silly to put cats on the blockchain until people realise that it's just a reflection of a tradable asset. So suddenly people have started thinking about what's this tradable asset we put in the blockchain, which doesn't sound as silly as cats on the blockchain. <laughs> and what ended up coming out of kit, uh, kitties as well is a standardisation of what it is to put a digital asset on the thing. So these are, they start, they've started in very unusual ways and they've moved very quickly into asset classes and, uh, and uh, sort of categories of interest that people don't find quite as, quite as silly as cats on the blockchain. <laughs> But the internet loves cats. Yes. So, <laughs> shows, okay, so we can see there's a little, a few people with a little bit of exposure to uh, blockchain in their matters and work. And today, this is a bit of a ranking one, just so we understand what you're really looking to get from today, uh, so we can tailor a few of the answers from our panelists. Excellent. Well, that's about 20, so that we'll crawl it. All right. So we know what we need to focus in on. A little bit of stuff around some of the basics. Right, and that will do for that. Now, as we go along, I thought I've, I haven't actually tried this one before, but if you have questions that pop up, don't have to use technology. You can be a Luddite, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> you can just put up your hand and say it very loud and clearly because there is a camera that's broadcasting or recording somewhere. Um, or you can pop in a question if you're perhaps a little more shy and don't want to, don't want to ask it. Pop it in there, it'll come up on my screen and then I can appropriately spring it on one of the panel. So, um, Awful lot has happened in the year to date in blockchain, but particularly given that one of our top three ranked issues was a bit of an understanding of blockchain basics, I would like each of the panelists to give us their best blockchain analogy, because then hopefully one of those will, will stick with you. And Peter, sorry, you're the last, so you might lose your best analogy <laughs> no. to one of these guys. <laughs> okay. We'll start with Tobias. Um, if you can give your best blockchain analogy, and maybe just a quick sentence or two why, why lawyers should care about this space. Um, I guess I draw on blockchain from my accounting and finance background. So I think of it like my general ledger, which is, records all the money that's going in and out of the organisation, a record of those things. But instead of it only being located in my company's data file, there's actually a copy everywhere else. So if somebody tries to steal some money or tries to do something creative in that ledger, and they just do it on the version that they have access to in my building, there's about, you know, thousands of others that check and say, oh, hang on, that's not valid. We're going to cancel that one out. And the actually agreed consensus version of my financial accounts is the one that everyone agrees has um, the most currency. So that way, it's really hard for someone to change a record or you know, embezzle money or that sort of thing. So that's an analogy that works for me. I think following on well from that, there's con absolute confusion in all rooms. People say blockchain, they mean very different things. And uh, without the context in which you're being asked, you really can't give an answer. So the way I sort of frame it is at sort of bookends, most people think of uh, Bitcoin. And you know, at the Bitcoin end, you always hear the same words, immutable, distributed, decentralised. Um, that's, that's a narrow view of what, uh, what this technology is. At the other end, where most of the conversation that I have is at government, from a government perspective and an enterprise perspective, they say blockchain, and they generally mean what they're already doing with a variation that includes some of that technology. So where you talk about uh, uh, private, they say, well, it's private, a little bit more private than we're used to, 
but not so private that no one knows. So they're the conversations that are happening from government and business. They're saying, we, we like what we've got, but this is a little bit better. So they're, they're sort of polar opposites. And uh, so there is no definition that people are agreeing on. In fact, I sat on a, on a panel yesterday where there was vigorous debate with lots of F-bombs being dropped where people said, there is but one uh, blockchain, Bitcoin, that's it. And at the other end, we said, it's every conversation in business. Because if you're talking about privacy, there's a blockchain element. Mm. If you're talking about uh, data, there's a blockchain element. That's the thing. And, and my favorite part, just adjacent to that, is blockchain fairy dust. Because if you say blockchain, yeah. <laughs> it relates to anything else now, people say, well, this is so I want to be in the blockchain business. So blockchain fairy dust definitely does help uh, conversations move along. Yeah, I have to agree. You know, blockchains, yeah, it's very hyped up, but I'd say it's a Google Sheets on steroids, and it's the next iteration of database technology and the internet. Oh, that's a burn for me because that's usually my analogy. <laughs> oh, no, <it's> <laughs> I, I often give that analogy of everyone knows Excel, we all love it, right? Or at least know it. Um, yeah, I always use that example of an Excel spreadsheet that's permanently locked on track changes is a pretty good analogy for people in terms of the, the guts of what the tech does at a lot of, even across that kind of spectrum. So tracking and preventing changes that aren't authorized within a shared network, which previously was basically impossible. So if you look at things like, um, you know, some of the major bank collapses in the last 20 years or rogue traders in particular, that kind of internal blockchain use by an organization that doesn't have to be at the cryptocurrency end can prevent fraud. And, and I think enterprise has only been waking up recently to the fraud prevention aspect. Or in the lawyer context, I often say, wouldn't it be great if your trust account um, was monitored or trust accounts in general were monitored more remotely, say, by the law society so that a rogue lawyer, have a few of them that there is, who's doing funky trust account transactions, will be caught immediately, and everyone's in insurance and other things might go down as a result. Um, or if there's an error in there, it can be flagged and, and corrected with, um, by someone else looking at it who isn't you. That's a useful analogy sitting there. Now, a question's already come in. Can blockchain operate like a perfectly transparent market? Ooh, you've got some utopians out there. <laughs> That's great. Or someone looking for an answer that is? Uh, yes, but unlikely. I was expecting a no. no it's a, you know, and I said the yes is in the, in the purest view of the world. These are all open blockchains. They're, they're accessible to anybody. They're distributed across the globe and they're unstoppable. It's not the world we live in, sadly. At the other end, you compromise because a lot of the data that people want to, to have in a marketplace, there's often someone that says we like some transparency, but we don't want full transparency to all these people. So this is part of that slider for me that says, where do you sit in this, in this spectrum? And I think a lot of the people that talk to me about that kind of an outcome, they say, this is gonna be great, it's gonna fix everything. And the example, I spoke to someone about a ticketing agency that, uh, that probably makes a lot of money from um, ticket scalpers. And they said, we're gonna solve the problem of ticket scalpers. I said, most people will be happy if you solve that problem. There's gonna be a percentage of people and businesses who don't want you to solve that problem because it's a faster way to make money than selling tickets one at a time. So I said, who are you talking to? So the decentralized, distributed, open to everyone version, great. I said, but the people that make money will resist. So again, you're sort of saying, where, where, is, this, uh, where is this going? So yes, in theory, it's like utopia. It's a, it's a great promised land for us, but uh, I think it'll be very hard to navigate through um, legacy systems to get those outcomes up. And another question popped up, which I think is very relevant for Tobias, which was how do you build something with blockchain and where to start? Can you walk us a little bit through your journey, Tobias? Um, yeah, so we, we're looking at that situation where when you write a will in Australia and most of the Western world, you can choose to store it wherever you like. So, you know, under the bed, in the wardrobe, safe deposit box, um, under your hat. And you tell your executor where it is and you hope they remember and you hope that the law firm that you kept it with still exists when you die and that they can find it. So we went, well, why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem because what happened to us was the death of an elderly family member and there was a will, the most current one with a lawyer, but there was also another copy floating around and so there were issues around capacity and so on. So we started to think about, well, what about it is the thing that made the most current version the real version? Why, why is that a problem? Why was it being challenged? And so there was lots of other things around there, and, and it was really that the person that challenged and contested that will didn't trust the conditions in which it had been produced. So one of the things that we, that you know, I've been following along the blockchain journey is that ability to trust that information because it can't be changed, or it's very difficult to change if you're using it in a way that Steve was talking about in that sort of open environment. So we went, well, okay, so we 
we've got this trust environment, now we need to work out, well, what are the things that you want to do? So that's part of looking at then, what are the different environments around? We don't want to have to build our own blockchain because there's lots out there that we can piggyback on, but it's finding the right one that solves and deals with the solution that we wanted to. So it was really looking at that point of trust where we had a problem that we wanted to solve and that was where we started. And then, um, you know, I've done a bit of education and reading around that and sort of start to play around with the use cases and the, the steps along the way that people need to interact with. Excellent. And Peter, did you have something else to add, but it can't be higher KPMG? <laughs> no, I guess, right, so this is around, uh, is there already something that make it transparent in the market or is something that you need to no, do? Just for the, how, do you, how does someone start building with blockchain? Yeah, I mean, From a legal perspective, if you can. Oh, yeah, legal perspective. I mean, it's it's just like you saw in the earlier session with regtech and checkbox.ar.ar. They're, they're making it really easy to do now. So the, the software and tools out there are easily available, like, you know, not, not just Ethereum, but you think about what Amazon and Google and, and Microsoft are doing on the cloud. They're providing you these tools to actually build out these blockchain applications and it just feels like those drag and drop software that you saw earlier. And so we're seeing a democratization of this and that means that the legal practices will be able to apply these in their own, for their own client bases, potentially just experiment um, and be able to see what it's like to actually build out a blockchain application. I think I'll, I'll only add to that, for someone who's looking to build something with blockchain, the big decision is whether they want to dive into creating some kind of product. Mm. But building products is really hard. I work with a lot of software developers and, and companies building out stuff, and it's just a really challenging job. Or to see what's in the marketplace that, as Tobias said, you can leverage from, perhaps even wrapping something on top to put it, to put that legal twist on things. Because there's certain things, um, I suppose, hashing and, and proving that documents are in a certain state is a very low-level thing that blockchain can do extremely well that is very high impact for almost every single industry and we'll get over there in the next few years very rapidly and that's probably an area I think lawyers will dip their toes into first and certainly many of the um, legal tech projects around um, law that I've seen, one of our clients, um, Legaler, and there's one out of the Netherlands called Legal Things that are very blockchain based. They're all about keeping those hash records to prove that documents are what they were and the timestamps they were created and we don't have legislative change in Australia yet recognising these in court, but we do overseas. Arizona's probably a leading one in the US where they've said um, courts can accept some evidence of uh, smart contracts being part of mm. part of contracts to not create invalidity. We have to rely still on the Electronic Transactions Act and sort of stretch it around blockchain as well. Mm. Um, what, do we, what do you see as the practice areas that will be most impacted by the rise of blockchain in the coming years? Your turn. Uh, the my answer will be the big answer. I think they'll all be impacted because ultimately the, the layer that sits... When people, people talk about the strict version of what blockchain is, blockchain is just data. So if you say if there is data in anything you're doing at work, it's likely to be impacted uh, by, uh, by the practice. I was, at a, uh, I was at an event at Hall and & Wilcox and I was, I was chatting with some of the lawyers there and, and one of the lawyers said to me afterwards, do you think property is going to be involved and impacted? I said, except for land registries, ownership of assets, tokenization of those properties, the ability to, to create liquid assets out of static assets, the ability to identify who... I said, I stopped and said, yes. All <laughs> these things are ultimately repositories of information that are valuable. And the thing that I see that really impacts is what gets created by something that's otherwise a static document. So in, in the case of a will, for example, or the common use cases, people talk about uh, your academic qualifications. Um, I haven't used my university degree since I gave it to my mother many years ago and said put it on the wall and it sits there. I don't, I don't seek to use it because it's awkward. I'm not going to grab it, photocopy it, attest to it. But if there's a digital version that allows me to push it out and say, yes, I'm qualified, there it is, and it costs me a fraction of what it would cost to contact Monash University, suddenly there's an asset that Monash can use and there's an asset that I can use or a third party might seek to use. So anything that's important there. So I'll start with the high level view that says across the practice, which is why Michael's become the, uh, the blockchain rock star in the, uh, in the legal fraternity because <laughs> you see it touching things yet. It's just, it just hasn't matured yet. So I'll start with everything and then everything else fits in right underneath there. So everything that email impacted, basically. <laughs> yes, pretty much. Because <laughs> even the e it's, email is a good one too because we say, what do you send if you know it'll be there forever? Uh, that, that impact is the, is the question. It's really both together. So when I say there's plenty of blockchains out there, 
um, if you've kept track of what's going on, you've got Bitcoin, you've got Ethereum, you've got EOS, you've got Cardano, there's a whole different bunch of different flavors of different types of blockchains and then you've got private ones like Hyperledger and, and various other things that are more protected and, and you need to qualify to join effectively. Uh, so it's really about the purpose that they're being designed for and how they're being used. And so some focus more on handling smart contracts um, rather than Bitcoin, which is more around handling a currency type of uh, arrangement. So they're trying to make them interoperable at the moment, but it's, some, it, you know, it's, a, it's a process because they're sort of all designed around their own particular sets of rules about how that data is managed, bundled up, packaged and so on. So. Is blockchain going to um, ultimately impact everything that's in the legal system? Um, and you are then attempting to select a blockchain for a particular legal purpose. What is the most important criteria that you need to consider when when you are liability of that blockchain? Because obviously it needs to be reliable within the legal context that it comes into the space at the moment. Really, you've got the issue. It's like when you write an email and you forget to delete that person you shouldn't have sent it to? <laughs> it, yeah, I, th I think in the short term, it's kind of the question is, uh, as, a, as a business, do you hire IBM or do you hire someone that says they can do the same things as IBM? In the short term, people, people, people gravitate towards what they trust. At the moment, the, the, some of the protocols that were mentioned here, their Hyperledger has support from IBM and a bunch of others. Uh, there's uh, the Ethereum Alliance has Microsoft Alliance. So businesses are aligning and it's becoming a question of confidence being built as these, uh, as these organisations are pulling together. So it is the sort of shifting sands at the moment, but the, all the professional organisations are laying bets. And this is one of the exciting things at the moment. You know, it's kind of, I look at it and say, wow, people are picking sides. Mm -hmm. uh, and those that aren't picking sides, and this is sort of a high level view of Australian government, for example, and what they're doing, not picking a side is like choosing, people use the old school, it's like a video recorder analogy, Betamax or VHS. <laughs> yeah. I said, we just don't have a video recorder at the moment. So that's, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's my problem. I'm okay with people being wrong, but you need to pick a side at the moment or you need to lay some bets. So it is all being formed at the moment. And just one other point was they all have different rules. So this is the thing that says, do you want fast, distributed, but uh, yes, but this one here is more secure because the people that we know are. So you're ultimately choosing one that has elements that are more uh, uh, align. Yeah. But I think for most people in, the le in legal practice, it won't really come down to choosing what blockchain they're going to be using. It's probably going to be more a choice of what's the application that makes sense and then understand, having a bit of understanding about what's underneath it is really useful. But uh, ultimately, there will come a day, hopefully in the not too distant future, where it's you know, like turning on a light switch. I tried to figure out electricity once, couldn't work it out. <laughs> but the lights still turn on, that's okay, and I use them. And I suspect for most people, blockchain will be like that. Um, so let the electricity people deal with electricity, I'm yeah. okay with blockchain. <laughs> But that's probably where it's going to head. So I, d I don't think anyone needs to think that they should go away and do a computer science degree, although it'll future-proof you very nicely. Um, but in terms of getting into that, you more want to focus on, well, what, what are the apps and having a bit of an understanding about what's underneath. But I think at this stage, where so much has happened so quickly in the last few years, some, cha some chains have had, you know, questionable origins. And, you know, Bitcoin has a big legacy issue of its early use in some of the Silk Road um, and, and other... Dark webs. Has everyone heard of the Silk Road and da the dark web? A couple of nods. For those who don't, the Silk Road was basically eBay for drugs and hit people on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't really exist anymore. Kind of. I'm sure it's, hi <laughs> I'm sure it's hiding there somewhere. Um, <laughs> but uh, ultimately, you won't need to care. It's more about focusing on what applications are going to deliver value for your clients from the legal perspective. But understanding what's under there is really useful so that you're not making a bad decision if you're going to invest into um, something that's going to give you a better outcome. You know, you want to make sure, oh, I understand that Tobias has chosen, has put the effort into researching what's going to work best in a Wilbit scenario to be able to attest and keep these things safe, and you guys can worry about making sure those the wills are being um, delivered to clients and appropriately. And, and compare and contrast, when I talk about the challenge it is how quickly the technology Michael's referring to has moved, uh, there's an ISO standard being developed and Australia's leading the development of this. I think it's a process that will take something in the order of three years to standardise the terms. So there's still another year or two before we can actually agree on what we're talking about. So this is this is where the, the tech and the, and the language have just not kept up, which is what's been one of the challenges. Again, where does it impact legal professions? The answers aren't out there. So the regulators themselves are giving very loose guidance, which then the lawyers will say, well, we think we sit on this side and we think we sit on the other. So even in that, in that formative stage, there are great opportunities to make the case 
um, for it. I've been in lots of rooms with the ATO and they said, it fits somewhere. <laughs> and you go, okay, yeah. so it just all goes into the that's big right. bucket in the, in, uh, in the middle. So that's that's the space. That's going to be my question, just in terms of, um, you know, for example, land registry seems to fit really beautifully in there. How long, how far away do you think that is realistically? Before? We've we've only really had the privatisation of land registries happening relatively recently. So the change in attitude to bringing in that kind of innovation, because previously as anyone who's done a title search will see, the font has not changed in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly prints and then gets scanned by yeah. someone and then yeah. emailed to you. Um, yeah. But now that we've seen that privatisation come in, there's a bigger incentive. So yeah. things are afoot. And um, the you know, world-leading Republic of Georgia did a um, blockchain of their land registry a couple of years ago as a pilot, and it worked rather well. I'm not really sure what happened then. Yeah. If they, they're part of Russia now? Uh, if, they, <laughs> if you Google it is what you'll see. I think Dubai has talked about yeah. the fact that they need that their whole government's going to go on the blockchain. I think there's a couple of American states where they're sort of talking about it. So if you, this is the thing about where you think the conversation is going. Just type in whatever word you think and the word blockchain after it. Mm -hmm. And if you do title registry, land registry and blockchain, you'll see a, a series of very early stage things or conversations at a high level. The, most of the things now when people come to me and say, I've got this great idea for blockchain, I say, which one? Because <laughs> we all hear the same idea. When the penny drops, people say, great, and land registry is a, is a classic. And once you say it works for land registries, then what registry doesn't it work hmm. for? The problem is cyber security and when things go wrong mm -hmm. as a lawyer, and land registry sounds very exciting until the titles are not what they're supposed to be. Um, and that's one of the challenges of getting legal advice, which is very, very, very conservative at this stage. We'll talk about social security yeah. and the interface blockchain. Yeah, talking about that. End user voting. Yeah, so I suppose when you're talking about that, you're really talking about the, the hash of the, the title. Um, and while the current level of hashing that's used is not necessarily quantum <laughs> computing <laughs> proof, um, there is a lot of work in that area. So it's when you can have consensus across what that hash should be of that particular title then you can start to have a bit more assurance, but you have to be planning ahead for it. And you know, If it's government controlled, that's less likely. And if it's privately owned and it's cheap to use this level, they'll use that level and, you know, until they have to be changed. So it's probably one of those things that is still, you know, there's a place for government to regulate and say, if you're handling this sort of stuff, you need to be thinking ahead um, and not just going to the easiest cheapest option. One of, the and one of the misconceptions, most of the things we talk about aren't actually stored on the blockchain. So the files aren't stored on the blockchain, it's incredibly expensive to store the thing on the blockchain. All, the only representation there is, is a digital signature. So there is a long string that points you to something else. And that is, a, that is something, that, again, when we say it's a public blockchain, it doesn't mean all the details. Those public blockchain strings um, are, are encrypted. So it's not, it's not that level of transparency. And it's, again, one of the things that's not communicated well when you talk to people about what blockchain is. They assume there's this thing and the door's open. It's not, it's sitting there and it's usually a representation that's stored somewhere else, but you can point to it and say, this representation which I have access to is a, rep a representation of the source document that sits behind. Again, it's, it's easier when you say fairy dust version of blockchain, it's all there. <laughs> this is the technology that's being built out that says it's not the thing, it's a representation of the thing to a level of security that you're ultimately uh, happy with. And I think that risk will reduce once government is getting more involved. So far in Australia, probably IP Australia is the one to watch. They have done phenomenal stuff, which has had almost no reporting on it, which hopefully will change pretty soon, but they're so far ahead of most of the other agencies in terms of what they're doing with some very exciting things. But I think a lot of government registries have so much efficiency and automation that they can get from this technology. It's just government moves slowly through proof of concepts and pilots to understand where it goes, because while blockchain technology is great at creating, I hate it being called a trustless system because people get all concerned and go, trustless sounds bad. I don't think I want something that's trustless. I prefer to say, well, no, it's trusting the system versus, then the, versus the actors who are responsible for maintaining a database. But when the government is able to still maintain that position as, you know, say, for example, ASIC, I mean, IP Australia maintains the trademark database, and we generally trust that they get that right. But you also want that emergency protection that if they make a mistake, they can fix it. But using some kind of blockchain tech to push out things from there is really, really useful because then you're just bridging the trust and you're reducing their costs of delivering a better service. Um, did you have a question, Sarah, or are you stretching? No, I Yes. Oh, yes. Um, yes, both? <laughs> <laughs> just, just in terms of um, uh, encryption security, um, one of the difficulties, of course, is, of course, the inability of government agencies to really easily come in and look at stuff. Um, and 
very, very blunt instrument that they could be used, and here I think you could do the tax on this, is an onus reversal. So I said, we'll not try to get in and see what your stuff is. We'll just tell you, you owe us $10 million. You want to sort that out. You just front up with the data. Do you think that that very, very blunt legal instrument is actually going to start to become more widely used? You mentioned a blunt instrument. Is that going to end up eroding our rights, essentially, as citizens? I have, no. a, I have a blunt. I have a bl uh, yeah. I have, <laughs> there's a blunter instrument. Now, how many in the room are familiar with the AA bill? Do we know about the AA bill? Were you busy near Christmas last year? You didn't notice this legislation being passed <laughs> through Parliament. Bill. Both the uh, both the uh, both uh, parties happily let it go through. It is a requirement if uh, asked upon by, asked by the government to uh, mandatorily put a backdoor in software. You're tapped on the shoulder, and they say, "Please make it available to us." And even blunt until it's and don't, and you can't tell anyone that we've asked you to do it. Uh, well, well so the, that's you, how they're deploying it, but yeah. technically under the act, it goes beyond that. But they've just said, on top of that, don't worry, we're not going to ask any individuals, because many people ask the question, well, what if I'm a developer and I get asked and I can't tell my boss? Yeah. So the solution was, well, we'll only ask your boss, no, we'll um, and the company will have to do it and then not to, not say. But um, the, slight can, the slight counterpoint on that is because of the very open nature of blockchain and that you can see any of the code that mm. runs smart contracts, it's actually quite hard to build backdoors into those things because people can see them versus traditional traditional software where it's actually quite hard to look at the code behind, say, Microsoft Word's processing, <laughs> yeah. except when it gives you all the codes when it crashes. Um, <laughs> then you can see some things then. But <laughs> the short answer is, I think, no, because the ATO doesn't really use that reversal of onus very often. Yeah, it's, at the moment, not often. And, and I suspect that, it, like anything that has that kind of extreme application in government, when things start to get rolled out, you'll have people resisting it a bit more. Uh, and that's when you might have courts getting involved to say, well, actually, is this a valid request? Or do they have a reasonable basis to reverse the onus? And reversal of onus is often used in, you know, it's like using the breach of the um, tax act to go after organized crime to say, where did you get that Lambo? Um, you know, so it, it is a valid question. <laughs> Unexplained wealth is usually the reversal of onus that comes from the ATO. You know, I mean, they're doing a lot of data matching of crypto at the moment. So we, we've spoken to a lot of exchanges earlier this year, and that's one of you know, the items on the year in review. of A lot of exchanges were getting, can you please hand over all of your data. customer data and trading data because we want to see if people are actually reporting. Mm -hmm. And the ATOs, they're not harsh. They're, their general comment to people is, look, if you're trying to report and you get it wrong, we're not going to crucify you because you're trying to do the right thing. I think that we're pretty lucky in Australia. Our culture is around that. You don't tend to get um, a very, very sharp, hard edge from the ATO unless you're being cheeky. And if you're being cheeky, oh, everyone's got a cheeky client who wants to push the boundaries on something, be it a contract or a tax point or something, and then they're going to come into a point of dispute sooner or later. I think it might just be the federal uh, parliament that's going to be the ones that uh, are just uh, taking away people's rights. I mean, I think so. <laughs> following on from that point, the, the, the AA bill is, is a significant piece of uh, legislation. The, the Five Eyes initiative, those who don't know Five Eyes, it's data sharing between five friendly nations, including the United States. They, they, they've made it clear that the, they want to share data and there are some really great reasons why they should. Um, some other things are going to get caught in that net and, uh, and the US government has now put pressure on their own companies. They've said, we've asked you nicely. We're actually, we're, we're of the view that the businesses should make these backdoors available. So the reality is this sort of evolution of what it is to have uh, encrypted end-to-end -end information, again, impacts across practice. How safe is it? What are the implications if you're mandating a backdoor into legislation and someone finds it because uh, who didn't opt out of my gov when they had the uh, health records uh, element? They sort of say, if you trust government to always be, uh, that's fine. But if you go to a website uh, called Who Pawned Me, uh, it'll give you an indication of all the passwords that you've already had breached. Or have a, sorry, it's called Have I Been Pawned, P-W-N-E-D, and you put in your email and it'll tell you you've been breached four or five times. So these are sort of the countervailing points, which are, I want to be encrypted, the government says this, where does it all flow? Blockchain, in a lot of respects, provides real security in relation to this because um, the processes that people are looking to build in are much more secure in a lot of respects than, than existing sort of data pools, which are honeypots. Excellent. Now, we had a couple of other questions that have popped up. One was, uh, what are some current examples of blockchain applications delivering significant real-world benefits? Peter, you've been 
quiet for a few moments? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to say. If you can do real yeah. project. <laughs> well, I think mean, all we're talking about so far is a lot of proof of concepts, right? You know, we're, we're seeing all these being developed, and I guess Libra is one of the largest developments in the year in review, which we'll get to later on. But in terms of like actual large-scale blockchain you know, benefits and ROI, you know, we're already still in the early days. If it's, only, it's only been 10 years since, I guess, the you know, Bitcoin first came out with the white paper from Satoshi. But uh, I guess this is probably only the first 20% of, I guess, the blockchain evolution. We're still very early days in actually developing these in production. Yeah. I mean, KPMG, we've got this, uh, essentially, KPMG origins, right? So the provenance of trying to track uh, everything from farm to table. You know, that's a very easy use case. Everyone wants to know that they're using, eating Aussie beef, you know, where they export it out to China and places like that. Um, but yeah, those sort of use cases are essentially reliant on the adoption and actually understanding, well, why do we need a blockchain for this? Why can't we just use traditional databases to solve a lot of these problems? And so, you know, waiting for something that, that killer use case is really still on the table. I think that one of the obvious ones, and the people of Coalescing Consortia are coming together. IBM has been at the forefront of telling that story, and a lot of it is storytelling as they bring people in. Uh, they've got one called Trade Lens, where they've taken Maersk and a bunch of other enormous shipping businesses, and they've, and they've consolidated some of the information. And the use case is that 30 to 40 percent of the costs of shipping something are related to the paperwork <coughs> and the admin associated with it. So there is an imperative and a really compelling use case that says if you get this right, this is what we're going to do. There's a food trust, <coughs> uh, one that's happening. Walmart in the United States is a mandated that its suppliers put everything on the blockchain. And someone said the other day, it's not because they're, uh, they're trying to make you better, they're just trying not to kill you. So if there's some sort of a food recall, they have the <coughs> capacity. Again, the, the business motivation is, uh, and this is one of the words, oh, I can say this in front of uh, boards and people get uh, really attentive really quickly. As soon as you say risk and governance, everyone pays attention. Yeah. If you talk about this thing that's going to transform and innovate, we're not interested. But as soon as you say your ass might be on the line, <laughs> everyone says, I'm going to lean in. I'd like to know why I'm responsible for this, uh, <laughs> for this thing. So again, they're the, the sort of the evolutions are internal business processes that make people more accountable. It keeps coming back to that, the permanency. When, when Michael said before, you know, uh, trustless, I, I, I say distrust. It, it allows you to say, well, I don't trust you, but the data, if it's much more uh, uh, robust, says I don't have to trust you as much as I used to. This is when this thing happened. Yeah. Distrust, now we're having even more negative words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, we've got the positive words. Trusty, yeah, right. the yeah. trusty system. Um, I'll throw in one, which is, I suppose, a high level one. Um, we still seem to be one of the few law firms that take cryptocurrencies but basically all of my overseas clients don't pay in bank transfers and everybody I know who worked in Forex has left Forex in the last two years so the Forex world is being eaten alive by people just moving money around on blockchains internationally because it's so much faster um, I've heard of several businesses which only operate to transfer funds between several um, jurisdictions that allow gambling because people literally take cash on airplanes at this very rarefied level because it's faster taking the physical cash than trying to move it through the banking system because it always gets held up. And I had a client the other day who said, I've got to get, not even a huge amount, I've got to get $150,000 into a, an account in Perth and it's stuck in the Isle of Man and it's going to go through another bank. And I said to them, you guys are nuts. You could have just sent it to us in, in Bitcoin or whatever and we could have just moved it through for you. Um, and it would have happened in a day. So the, the international remittance and Forex market is terrible at moving money. It's so slow. Um, and a lot of that is just because of the way that the rules have, have arisen around AML, KYC, and a lot of these really slow checks. And some of my friends from the Forex world have said, there are still banks in America that literally will get faxes for the, for the uh, Forex and then lose the fax. And then you have to ring them three days later and say, what happened? And then they'll say, oh, we found it. It was in a shoebox. Um, <laughs> because that's how they manage it. Because they have these strange little state-based banks in the US that just don't exist here. We're very lucky to have a nice, strong federal system. Um, that's where I see the biggest benefit has come sort of in the last 10 years is that remittances. Now, consensus was putting a number up the other day saying that 15% of US foreign remittances was happening on blockchain. I don't believe that for a second. I think it's probably more like 1% uh, because I think if it was 15%, you'd see a lot more activity in the actual markets and the blockchains themselves because there's so much remittance that goes on. But there's also been some projects around the Philippines and other countries with remittances and Libra ties into that as part of their vision to help move money internationally very quickly. Um, be able to move things in seconds around around the world. So that's that I think is the biggest real world benefit that's happened from any blockchain tech to date. The Walmart one's a really useful one as well. And, and I think the the example of money and this this is again it's the the benefit of being in this room. The truth is, and I said this yesterday, the room you are less than the one percent. People are not asking these questions. They're not educating themselves in relation to it. 
But once you know that you can move money quickly, um, Binance moved something, that the, a whale who someone has a lot of cryptocurrency, uh, there was movement that was I think well north of a billion dollars recently and it was less than a hundred dollars. Cost them a hundred dollars to move a billion dollars. So they say, what does that mean for money, for money transfer? Um, the speed with which things can move, uh, Swift as a, as a payment channel. Well, everyone that's in finance knows Swift. They say Swift, nothing's happening with Swift. Swift for a long time said, blockchain's not a thing. And now Swift has said, we think blockchain yeah. is a thing and we're moving towards <laughs> blockchain. These things are happening. I spoke uh, uh, about a business in Australia where they effectively said, Swift Network, we're not looking to displace it. We're just going to make it a little bit better. They raised, I think, eight to $10 million in the stock market and went to a 25 or $35 million market cap. This is the thing that once you know maybe moving money is far, faster is a good outcome, what does it mean for business and what does it mean for my existing clients? And that, that's sort of the lens that we try to get everyone to look at, which is, is it better? Yes. Who gets moved out of the way? Who can move into the, uh, into the space? So that, that, the question is the one that follows the initial one, which is, would it be better to do, uh, to do this? So how long will PEXA last before someone replaces it with a blockchain <laughs> system? <laughs> Everything's getting replaced. I'm getting replaced. <laughs> but for lawyers, I suppose, how many people deal with any conveyancing? You can do a show of hands. Oh, only a couple. All right. And keep your hand up if you enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Check it. None. Very honest folk in the room. But even, you know, that, that extra, the old style way of swapping checks over the table for a settlement uh, is already checks. starting to be gone digitally, but doing it on blockchain is still superior to a system like PEXA where an outage... Why haven't the blockchain land registries um, succeeded in this spread? I think there's been three cases that have been reported, but they haven't been widespread. Legacy networks. Yeah. It's hard to move people. Okay. Yeah, it works, works really well, save for the people who think it doesn't work really well. Um, that's the biggest challenge. I mean, I, I did a presentation yesterday on governance, and I said the governance issue is not about is the protocol good, is the tech good? The governance issue is who doesn't want this to happen or what do we need to get through in order for it to happen? So the technology is, is developing rapidly, but getting people to change is, is, a, is a much more difficult uh, process. Because the, the stakeholder engagement's really needed. The, I mean, the ASX project to replace chess, which is a 35-year-old piece of software that's mm -hmm. done a pretty good job to date, but, you know, when it was made, Space Invaders was a thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, that, the, the need to consult stakeholders in moving something that's that important so government and anyone sitting on these really important databases will move very slowly. So I know a business in Sydney that all they do is provide a wrapper to ASIC, right? You can create a company through them, they're a registered ASIC agent, they will just mirror the shareholdings on um, a private Ethereum blockchain they run, so there's no fees in doing it, but they just charge a subscription fee monthly for people to manage their cap table, and then they're starting to introduce some new features to say, well, now that we're doing this and it's all very secured with hashes and we'll mirror it to ASIC, no more filling in Form 484s and other things that people get confused about. Here's a nice Google-style interface that people are comfortable with. So I think we'll start to see more of those kinds of offerings, that people will just be a little wrapper on a government service, do that beautiful UX that government has challenges getting through because stakeholder and design by committee, um, and just make it really nice moving through. And you know, we may start, start to see that kind of thing in uh, lands as well once there's a bit more movement towards lands being on there. Oh, there was another question. So there, oh, there was also a question about how do blockchain providers earn an income? Is it a fee-for-service subscription or what? Yeah. Peter, would you like this one? Well, there's always the, uh, you know, you can actually be an investor on it. <laughs> you can buy some Bitcoins right now and actually make some money. But uh, yeah, there is uh, some rewards to the miners actually actually do the compute, actually generate these new uh, cryptocurrencies uh, on top of the blockchain. Or you can take a clip of the ticket. So there is a lot of... Um, the parties out there that, you know, so just for example, like gas, when you're actually doing transaction, they do take a clip from what you're trying to expend, for example, on Ethereum. Yeah, it, it, blockchain as a service. I mean, the, the big businesses that you see, effectively, they're trying to push people towards the Microsofts of this world, the AWS, Alibaba are pushing you to their cloud service. So they say we can spin up some nodes and we can do blockchain as a service and then you store everything here. So effectively, they say here's a tool set and, and then store everything where you're comfortable storing it as well. And I think it's important to, to draw a distinction between you know, the, the miners that Peter, that Peter spoke about, which is, does everyone know what miners are in the blockchain context? So they're the computers that, for our purposes, keep an entire copy of all the transactions that have ever happened and sit there processing transactions and checking them with every single other computer in the network to make sure no one's doing anything wrong. So they're really just a glorified bunch of hard drives and some processing, <laughs> and they're the ones chewing up all this electricity that you, in these dreadfully unfair media reports, claiming that Bitcoin's using up all the electricity <laughs> in the world. Um, and they get a reward known as a mining reward for, do, for providing that service. But when you actually make a transaction, say in the cryptocurrency context, there's a transaction fee. And they tend to be processed in order of who's offering the most money in a fee. 
So the other day I was trying to buy some digital horses. Cover your ears, honey. Um, uh, digital collectible horses. And I couldn't figure out, you know, I know a fair bit about blockchain. I'm like, why do I keep missing out on these great names, digital horses? I'm like that. And it could be the next crypto kitties. But then I realized because I had my transaction fee turned down really low, so I bumped it up by like one cent. And then all of a sudden I was getting all the horses I wanted and spending all this money. And then I got into trouble. Um, but it's okay now. Um, so there's the transaction fee part. So ultimately in a network, say the Bitcoin um, blockchain, when it finally has all of its Bitcoins released, it will rely on transaction fees to incentivize people to run computers to process the transactions and have the network operate. But most of the blockchain providers are either subscription based. Uh, the provider we use to process cryptocurrency payments for us charges us, I think, about one or one and a half percent. So you have this interesting, this one? That's one. a good thing you remember. <laughs> <laughs> but that's cheaper than credit card processing for many people, right? Yeah. So there's this interesting thing that already, with a pretty simple change, you can go, well, clients aren't going to want to wear the merchant fee for credit cards, but if you can nudge them over to crypto, hey, it's a slight margin improvement on, on processing of transactions. So there's this very interesting thing that even these smaller operators are able to charge so much less than these very large at scale payment processes, which is one of the reasons why a lot of people have gotten excitable about um, Libra when it was announced fairly recently. Does everyone, everyone read about Libra Ride? Keep your hands down if you did. <laughs> well, everyone heard about it, great. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to talk about it. Does anyone want, want to know anything about Libra? Yes? You should. Yes, good answer. Yes, you should. You should want to know about it. And it kind of ties in, I think, to some of the blockchain adapting to different laws across jurisdictions, which I think it's the reverse. It's more about how a law is trying to adapt to blockchain. Mm -hmm. For my sins, I help Blockchain Australia's Markets Committee, and we're putting together some lists of um, regulatory blockers around crypto assets. Australia had a very early lead. We were very early in putting in um, the anti-money laundering counter-terrorism financing legislation in 2018 for cryptocurrency exchanges. We have something in the order of, when did I last check, about 250 or 260 exchanges registered into Australia. 99% of them aren't actually operating here, or maybe 98%. But um, we, was, we were really, really early in that space, which is fantastic. Unfortunately, like in many cases, Australia takes a, a sprint out of the gates and then we get a little tired. And some other people get ahead and then we have to struggle to catch up. Um, we don't even have a video recorder. <laughs> so um, we're now working, to, I think, to play a bit of that catch up. And it's awesome that the rules in Parliament have changed that we get to have a Prime Minister for more than six months. So um, that's going to help a lot, I think. Um, we've been promised a blockchain roadmap by the federal government, so we're all waiting eagerly for that. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Um, but really... It's interesting the China, China comment that came up in that question because they've had lots of bans yet several, in, any, in any given month they seem to have an awful lot of activity and some things that are supposedly illegal there. Yeah. But Ch China, is, China is winning in, with respect to this technology because it's, I described this the other day, yesterday. I said government bottom down, top up. You know, we're an innovation driven, create the idea, we'll nurture you. China's government says, here's what we're doing. It's a much more efficient way to deploy resources. And, uh, and, get, and get outcomes. And, and the rally at the moment is they said, yes, we don't want you to crypto trade, but they're mandating, they're mandating across a lot of businesses and supporting startups and saying, if you've got a blockchain idea that makes business more efficient, then we will support you with very significant sums of money. So it's one of these odd things that's happening globally. We think our rules prevent the bad things from happening, but we're actually missing out on some of the technology opportunities because people aren't willing to fund it. And the Chinese yeah. central bank has announced that they're going to put out a central bank issued token, which some have interpreted as a direct response to the Libra mm -hmm. announcement, yeah. similar to SWIFT putting out their announcement that they're going to move everything to a distributed ledger as well, which came out on a weekend, which is very unusual. I didn't think anyone at SWIFT worked on the weekend. <laughs> but immediately after the Libra announcements came out, SWIFT dropped their, their announcement as well. So this kind of stuff in the payments and banking world is is moving along fairly swiftly. And the Chinese thing, I don't know if you've seen, again, the social scoring. I don't know if you've seen the social scoring mm. issues that are happening in China now, where effectively, you know, your face is being recognised. And if you jaywalk, it identifies you and, and your face pops up on a screen. It's very, it's very uh, 1984 on steroids. Um, but that's a, that's a government that has access to all the data and worries less about the privacy implications and says, what can we do with this mm. to create better systems. This is, the, this is the data arms race. And the question then becomes, how does it impact my practice? How does it impact the firm? You say, all the ways. All the ways is where it's, uh, it's going. Well, there were some more nods about Libra. So which of you would like to give a, a very high level overview of what Libra plans to be? I'll start and then I can stop talking for a while. Um, <laughs> uh, the thing to know initially is stable coins. If you've heard the word stable coins, when people talk about cryptocurrency generally, the stable coin 
is effectively a reference of something that has uh, another asset, dollar asset behind it, the sort of that it's pegged to. So it makes it stable, hence the name stablecoin. So uh, the Libra offer is ostensibly, I think it's four currencies at the moment, where they said in order to eliminate the wild fluctuations you might otherwise um, have, it's going to be backed by USD, Japanese, I think the, the pound and one other. Um, and, uh, and it says, so that means you can rely that one dollar in Libra is equivalent to the dollar you're used to opening and paying out of your wallet. So that's foundationally the way they've tried to create the, the certainty. Yeah, and uh, you know, Facebook is trying to you know distance itself from being the Libra Association because it's a party of twenty eight other vendors like you know uh, we got Uber, Lyft, we got uh, Mastercard, and Visa. So these are some pretty serious players, but you haven't heard from any of them since the Senate hearing. So Facebook, uh, the head of uh, I guess the Libra program, Calibra, uh, essentially faced the Senate after being grilled by all these U.S. senators, and uh, he pretty much just put his body on the line and talking about, okay, we'll get all these regulations in place, we'll talk to the right stakeholders, we won't launch until we get all of the relevant requests from the US government on, on site. But then you don't, it's quite silent of all the other Libra Association members to not actually make the same announcements. So they haven't actually bought in. Um, and apparently they haven't actually paid uh, the $10 million fee to be part of a node as part of this 28. You know when they do that thing in the comments, they say, if you want to volunteer, step forward, and everyone steps back? That's yeah, right. yeah, that's right. <laughs> Facebook was left yeah. there. And, uh, but what's, what's fantastic about it is that it's done a lot of the heavy lifting on the regulatory side, mm. because it's actually started discussions. You've got Donald Trump tweeting about Bitcoins, how it's saying the US dollar is better than you know any other you know, denominated digital currency. So it's creating a lot of awareness, but also people are starting to line up around what does that regulation look like? So it's, it's actually great for the ecosystem. Maybe if you're not a start a startup that's trying to do a stable coin, that's trying to do what Libra was doing, but for the general crypto community, it's creating a lot of certainty in that regulatory and It's a good framework. Again, the, the, it, so the example I gave, the sort of bookends, mm -hmm. do yourself the favor. If you read Libra, you'll form a decision. You'll say too centralized or not centralized enough. Um, you'll say government, not, not enough government. It gives you a frame of reference, and that's been one of the challenges in, in this sort of landscape generally. There's so much to read and so much to consume. These sorts of anchors, I think, make it easier because the US government, I think, called them to account within maybe two weeks of the announcement, yeah. where they said, get here and get here now. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then they spent a lot of time saying to Facebook, we would like you to stop this until we figure out what the hell it is mm. and how it might impact us. So again, it's just the impact is potentially, they view it as potentially uh, systemic, I think is the is the concern. Yeah. And it's it's trying to tackle a serious problem. I mean, you know, in, in the white paper that they talk about, you know, how it's, you know, we've got 1.7 billion people that are on bank. So that's their sort of, you know, the, the, the white knight uh, <laughs> narrative that they're trying to tell. But, uh, you know, when they're actually looking at it, they've got 2.7 billion users around the world, so they can actually use that to onboard a new currency. At the end of the day, if you're working with, say, Western Union or MoneyGram, it's about 7% when you're trying to remit back your money back to your family. So if you're in Australia and you're trying to remit back to, uh, say, you know, Papua New Guinea or the Philippines, yeah, that's that's around 7%. So $500 might turn to $50 going into these remiss remittance fees. And so those sort of uh, developing countries will be the first places that adopt it. Well, and there were some interesting rumours about Mark Zuckerberg spending an extraordinary amount of time in Indonesia, mm. where there's, a, you know, there's developing countries have had some alternative payment systems that have operated in some places using mobile phone credits as an alternative form of currency, where there's a bit of, of currency wonkiness. So I suspect that Libra will launch in developing nations first because it'll also be easier to get the government on board. Mm. And there's always already a few, like the Eastern Caribbean looked to do a digital dollar there. The Marshall Islands wanted to change their currency over to a purely digital system. But what I see is telling in the network is that last year Uber spent $800 million on credit card fees, which will go away mm -hmm. if they process their payments into Libra. So I, and it's interesting that MasterCard and Visa are in, are in the association as well, uh, yet there's no banks. Mm -hmm. So the banks have stayed well clear of it. Um, but even for those 20 or so companies that are in there, or 27, they're, the one thing they have in common, even the non-for-profits, is they're massively into international money movements and, re and remittances going around. And this, if nothing else, is a fantastic way for them to reduce their costs in a very significant way. So the narrative about helping people, uh, I think one of the comments from the gentleman in front of the Congress was, they said, how, how will you make money? We'll get users who are unbanked and then we'll have advertising. And I immediately thought, well, no, you won't because the unbanked people are probably of the least value to Facebook. Whereas the transaction on your Uber from Melbourne airport to here is probably more, you know, that transaction fee to the banks is worth yeah. more than what maybe several days of or, or months of advertising usage of some un, some other user. 
But the short of Libra is that, does everyone have Facebook? <laughs> Instagram, WhatsApp, uh, Oculus. So the idea is they'll, it, is they'll be able to put yeah, a, a wallet to piggyback on on those apps, so that you'll be able to move money around very easily in there and use it to pay, just like Apple Pay or just you know we're all getting used to that um, credit card tap and go style. So you'd expect to see that come out when Libra is launched, that you'll be using say WhatsApp or a Facebook app to be able to go tap and pay. And some people are suggesting that you know the uh, association members will be starting to offer discounts because it'll be so much cheaper for them to accept the payment that they might be saying, oh, it'll be ten dollars in Australian dollars if you're paying by credit card, but nine dollars ninety if you're paying <coughs> via Libra, thus encouraging people to go and buy the Libra token and hold on to it. <laughs> so it's it's a very interesting project, and as Peter said, it's going to drive a lot of the regulation forward that otherwise most countries in the world have said. The blockchain world is too small to worry about. Most reserve banks have said that in writing in their little report, saying it's all very small, we don't need to worry about it. And then Libra came along and said, uh oh, yeah. it's going to get very, very big, very, very fast. Mm -hmm. Question? How do you regulate something that transcends jurisdictional boundaries? And does government have sufficient literacy, tech literacy, to actually understand the risks that they're trying to regulate? I was going to say good lawyers. <laughs> yeah. Is the answer to that? after that poll. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a fair answer. I think the government, international regulation and harmonisation is really hard. So the, um, obviously with all the movement around the ICO space previously, uh, IOSCO, which is the International Association of um, Financial Regulators, is trying to push hard and we're quite lucky. Australia's really interesting with Australia because we lead some of these international groups like the, the um, ISO group, the WIPO standard on blockchain. Greg Medcalf is now running, heading up the OECD's blockchain and he used to head, head up ASIC here. So we've got these Australians in these really critical international um, positions to help with the standardisation, but it's always a process. Get the standards in place so we know what's going on and then figure out how to treat like for like. So governments have to harmonise on this. So I think this forces everyone to get into a common position that will work. So particularly in relation to all the madness of ICOs that happened in the last few years, various governments have taken different positions, either an outright ban like China and India, um, the UK just dropped what's considered to be a very friendly um, policy last week or the week before, saying we're just going to say a whole bunch of these things like Bitcoin are completely unregulated and don't come crying to us if you lose all your money. Um, then you have like the SEC approach saying oh, we'll exempt some things but we're going to keep a really close um, lid on everything else. Uh, and then you have, you know, in Australia where if, if you go talk to ASIC you'll probably be politely invited to go seek your own independent legal advice. <laughs> um, so. It's going to take time, and like everything, the law just lags behind technology. It took a long time for click wrap and browse wrap to get really clear decisions, and even you know, Google and the ACCC's actions going up to the High Court over how advertising it was, whether or not it was misleading and deceptive, and whether they would have liability for people using their platform to try and um, buy competitors' words to lure away search. It just takes a long time to get there, and then unfortunately by the time decisions are made or laws are made, it's uh, often too late. I think with enough industry consultation early, things like the AML CTF laws are really robust and work. Unfortunately, they only covered fiat to crypto, i.e. changing Australian dollars into, say, Bitcoin. So every single exchange which let you change cryptocurrencies to cryptocurrencies, totally unregulated still. And those will then come into um, regulated umbrella soon, but not yet, because it takes a while for these things to be mandated. We also have an interesting position with the um, upcoming ban of cash transactions over $10,000 which looks like it covers digital currency, but then in the explanatory memorandum, they've said, don't worry, it won't. Um, <laughs> it says digital currency. No, no, but it says, but it does. It's like the explanatory <laughs> memorandum says, don't worry, it won't. Uh, we expect the treasurer to exempt it. <laughs> well, okay, we'll see what happens. Um, so, you know, it's very hard, and democracy and, and the way we, we make laws takes a lot of time. Um, so it's going to be difficult for that synchronization to happen. Things like FATF and those other international organizations, mm -hmm. they put out recommendations and even with treaties, there's many treaties Australia signed, but we never actually ratified them by passing the laws. So um, it's going to be a bit of a hodgepodge approach. And then you've got industry bodies and other lawyers and other people trying to push forward to, to bring that harmonization. And I think a good example of how, uh, this is a super complicated space, you think of something like the GDPR and all the implications of people with respect to the data, and that's without the challenge that is these things going at a million miles an hour across jurisdictions. That in and of itself is, I think Facebook 
when GDPR was rolled out fully, there was a story that they basically moved everyone back to the United States. Rather than complying, it was so onerous, I said, we'll just take our people back to a jurisdiction that's much more friendly. And that's one of the fascinating things to watch in a jurisdictional way. Malta, for example, Estonia, uh, Singapore, you know, uh, traditionally countries now that either want a, a greater role in the, in the global stage or financially are sort of disproportionately punching above their weights, Taiwan and the like, they've been more open to the, uh, the leadership of regulation, whereas the reticence, the United States is a classic. It's so many, so many things happening that it's stifled. So you say, here's the home of capitalism and they can't agree on anything. In fact, now it's much more this, we're gonna ban this. And Donald Trump didn't just say the US dollar was good. He said it's the best currency and it's the it's best currency that's ever yeah, gonna be. Good. So uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this yeah. is clearly the US position with respect to it. So that's part of the opportunity as well as saying, what, what does this mean from a jurisdiction at the moment? You know, is, is this something she'll be focusing in, in the Singapore region and, and Asia Pacific, because that's where the activity is? Or is the EU where I should be moving these things to? But yeah, woefully un, uh, unprepared, everybody. And unfortunately that scene, I've helped a lot of people in the last six months restructure out of Australia, in part because of the AA bill and in part because of an inability to get clear guidance from the government, which is very unfortunate. We've raised that with our new minister for FinTech, um, who's just, started her portfolio. We've never had a minister for fintech before, so we're hopeful there might be some changes, but Australia is suffering a brain drain and drain of people just going to other jurisdictions that will be friendlier. Regulatory arbitrage. Um, but speaking, you mentioned Estonia, and I think Tobias had a bit of knowledge of Estonia, and you've been a little quiet, so yeah. tell us a bit about Estonia's experience in blockchain and DLT. Yeah, so Estonia adopted um, blockchain and, and distributed ledger technologies as a way of um, yeah, streamlining their electoral processes and a lot of their government processes. And, you know, it's been really effective and they've had a lot of people, you know, technology companies going to Estonia and they've got a nice, shiny um, website advertising, hey, come here and, it's, mm -hmm. and everything's great. But they've now been caught in the wave of um, right-wing conservatisms that's sweeping through Europe. So they've now got a, a new finance minister that's fairly right wing. The flip side of that is that they also have all this amazing amount of data about their population, their ethnicity and so on, which is now potentially um, you know, looking at that weaponization of that data against its own population. So um, you know, you, these are the, the risks that you know, when we put this information and in, you put it in the hands of government, that you are exposing the opportunity for governments to say, we don't like that ethnic block. Now we have a way of being able to really quickly identify them and prejudice, prejudice our systems against them. So it's a potential you know, flip side of all the, you know, the, the great things that blockchain and, and these sort of technologies can do. Um, you know, it's, it's that thing of what, how, how much do we trust our governments? Like the reference to MyGov, earlier like we a lot of people opted out I know you know um, my family um, who, my partner was a nurse and she's like I'm not going in that because I don't trust them because <laughs> she's seen the network and seen how the, the, the data works and, and this is a, this thing when we start to move to that single digital identity who are we trusting with it and how how is it being managed and you know that slowness of regulation to catch up and people's willingness to exploit loopholes wherever they are and you know as humans we're great at looking for the the, the quick win or oh I could try that and it works and so like you, you either create a product around it or you slip quietly under the radar until someone discovers you um, and then goes that's not very good let's do something about that so I think it's just something to be aware of and be mindful of as we you know embrace this sort of technology because it is really powerful on both sides of the fence. And I think related to that, that exact point, do you, should you own your own data? And the, the, the conversation around sovereign identity, and again, it's, it starts as a small conversation and becomes an enormous one. Should you be able to identify yourself as you see fit, as opposed through, um, through some mandatory requirement? Again, use cases and the way this potentially develops, you think of something as simple as anyone that's ever had to fill in a form to lease uh, property, you fill in this enormous form with a bunch of information that you don't really don't want to give people. Um, you hand it across to them, you need to trust them with it, and then you go to the, the next property and you're asked to do exactly the same thing and the exactly the same thing. The capacity within your own phone to say, here's the level of information I'm willing to provide you. A certainty that I earn an income and I exist as a human being. Done.
why why do it the other way? So then it becomes this conversation about who you know who who owns it, who should own it, what should we what should we do? And that's the flip side to the Estonia situation. If you always own your own data, you don't need to worry, save for of course hacks and losses, <laughs> the capacity to identify yourself in a manner that you see fit. And this was the for me the seminal moment. That the, I was sitting in a room listening to a bunch of people talking about e-commerce people talking about the perfect uh, set of data so they could market to me in a perfect way. And I said, I don't want you to market to me in a perfect way. I want to decide how I'm marketed to. And that was the thing that flipped me into uh, thinking this straight line to perfect avatars and we know all the information. Yeah. I said, it's not a world I want to be living in. So I'd, I'd much rather control a lot of elements of my own information. And there are people that are you know, adventuring in this space. Um, there's, there's a lady in Europe who's basically set up a website and you can buy the information you want to know about her and her life. Mm. Um, so she's basically said, well, everything's for sale. Some things are worth more things than others. And so she's now said, well, you know, my life is a whole bunch of data that you all want to know about. So I'll charge you for it. So, and that thing of owning your story, you know, as we adopt and embrace technology much more and we have become indoctrinated into just giving away our privacy. We sign user agreements, click of a button. You carefully read them though, right, today? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read Before the market. Clicking them. <laughs> but that's the thing, that's that's what they count on. It's like that's why it's like, you know, in two point font and it's twenty pages long and in legalese. Mm. So that you don't read it. I prefer to call it plain English drafting. <laughs> 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 I'm waiting to see that. <laughs> Clearly, you haven't seen much. Um, <laughs> but it is a it is a thing that we we've become so used to doing is just giving away our information. We we we're not actually going. We haven't flipped to that point yet where, as a population, we've gone actually. You know, being private and being able to control what I let other people know is really important. And we say it often to our boys, it's like, well. Gee, I'm glad Facebook didn't exist when I was a kid because I did lots of stupid shit <laughs> and nobody knows about it. Whereas you see these young people now and they're broadcasting it everywhere and it's there forever. And the scary bit on the, the digital, when, in my dark had a digital strategy life, uh, I usually know the answer to this question. If you are a Facebook, uh, if, you, if you have a Facebook account, just put, put your hand up if you have a Facebook account. <laughs> Don't hack things too. I, yeah. hack them. No, I, I, I don't need to. Um, you already have, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> if, if, if you if you log out of if not shut it down if you log out of your Facebook account regularly, keep your hand up. So if you don't log out, you have given Facebook effectively the perpetual right to follow you across the internet. They track you via what's known as a Facebook pixel. So if you don't log out, the pixel follows you. So when you go to another website that has the code on there, it says, Facebook, they're over on my website as well. And they follow you around the internet much more effectively than they do with cookies. That's because people can't be bothered scrolling down to the thing which you'll find is awkward and difficult to find that says log out. And the main reason you don't log out is you go, I don't remember what my password is. I can't be bothered logging in again. So this is, this is something we've become very familiar and comfortable with. That, that's, that's the exercise. But you are being followed at a granular level across these things. And it's the cost of convenience. I don't want to log out because I'm going to log back in again tomorrow morning anyway when I wake up. And the first thing I do is check my phone to see if anyone's spoken to me on, the, on Facebook. So serious implications. Again, this is when you start talking about sovereignty. You go, a blockchain element says you never give them that data, so you never have to worry about opting out of that, uh, that system. Well, privacy is a very real issue. I was on a panel a couple of weeks ago sitting next to a gentleman who initially we all thought he was a bit tin hat level, but then we all wanted the tin hats by the end of the, the other day. <laughs> uh, because he, he, his opener was, I'm the guy who wrote the software that tracks everything you're doing and, yep. and figures out what you're going to buy before you do it, and now I've stopped doing that, yeah. and I'm telling everyone how to try and protect themselves. Um, and that is, that is often a, a big problem around blockchain, because a really awesome, difficult to change database record of what's happened is either dystopian or utopian, but probably more likely to be dystopian. Um, it's just how carefully is it used and what is it used for. And it was interesting as well with the Libra um, questioning around Congress was they were getting hammered with privacy questions and then almost in the same breath, and how are you going to stop money laundering? And everyone sort of goes, but these are very difficult issues that pull in different directions about sharing, sharing information. But I, I mean, I share Steve's concerns that people, people appear to uh, 
be happy to pay the price of convenience to give away an awful lot of information. So I, I personally have, from an economics perspective, a dubious view of whether people will care enough because if it's easy and they're, and they're given some kind of benefit, they'll take the benefit if it's, if it's fun or, or useful. Yeah. Like that Russian face app that would make yeah. you look older. And you, someone pointed out, you're giving them the rights to your face forever, which is a wonderful set to train facial recognition on Hilarious. in order to go, oh, look what I look like older or younger if you wanted to do the younger one. And, the, and this is like, again, the other myth is Bitcoin isn't anonymous. I mean, it's, you know, I have the slide that says private, pseudonymous and anonymous. Bitcoin is pseudonymous. It's difficult to figure it out. But when you have the same things that governments rely on, metadata, onboarding, your, your accounts say this, you leave, you leave breadcrumbs through. And there are businesses that have, uh, I think, potentially are soon to be unicorns that are data matching for government. And they're saying, we have enough information to know that this thing, which looked like it was anonymized, is most likely to be this particular person. How much money are these big companies making out of data? Oh. Uh, Google had, think, Their entire business? Yeah, g g Google. <laughs> there is the scary note. So Google at the moment in liquid assets. I think they've got well over $100 billion in liquid assets they oh, can well deploy. More than that. That, yeah, Apple, that's the, that's Apple the, had about $100 billion. Yeah, so they, I think they have similar sorts of numbers. You go, they can deploy, that's the liquid stuff. So forget the liquid that's stuff. The, yeah, that's literally cash. cash. They just have parked offshore, and it's, they almost don't know where to put it. It's, so it's really crazy money. They don't want us to own our own data. No. <laughs> no. But, but, the, but the problem is if you divide Google's user base by sort of the number of users and their revenue, you come out to about three or 400 bucks a year per person. So you kind of say, well, are you going to log out for effectively a dollar a day if you could if you could somehow capture all that value for yourself? I always say to people doing privacy blockchains, mm -hmm. is there a market for it? Because I don't care enough to yeah. do a dollar a day. They can just have my data. That's fine. Um, because it's just, is it worth it? That's the problem, is that our own data individually in the marketplace is actually not worth a whole lot. Mm. So it's very hard to incentivize people to try and protect their data unless they're very privacy-centric. And so a lot of people are trying to raise awareness, like, like Steve, about was it being used for? Do you actually know and want that? And some people care, but then other people go, no, I want to you know, put some cute cat ears on my head on a picture and, oh, that's great. Um, yeah, yeah. And then they don't care that they've given away all this information to someone else because it all gets aggregated and anonymized and, and you know, they think there's no impact on them later. Mm -hmm. But you know, you... That's how it's going to be used. No. Well, that, that's the thing, right? You see, I mean, it's showing my age, but having grown up with a parent who was in, in Europe in World War II and afterwards under the Russians, you know, there's a certain view of if something bad has happened with data by, at a government level, there's a very restrictive view of who should have your information and be very private. Um, and no one in, the, I think, the modern world of, and the rise of the internet have really lived through that in a major way yet. And that might change things if there's, a, if there's something like that that's a very bad outcome. And the, so the social good opportunities, again, that's a, the optimism on the social good side, you can have someone that's, uh, that's been displaced who can leave the other side of the world and arrive and have access to a digital reference of their history. So at the moment, it's a thing, get rid of everything because we don't want to be found here because we might suffer. Yeah. The upside here is potentially if there's some digital record that is otherwise encrypted or hidden, it doesn't matter, it go across the borders. The countervailing view, you can leave Australia and when the box says, have you taken $10,000 out, you can say no, and you can land on the other side of the world and send yourself the $1 million <laughs> that you were carrying in Bitcoin or something else that were on the other side. So this is the, the upside and the downside of these, uh, these flows across, well, across border. Well, you carrying it with you, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because there was a US so, congressman so, tried to introduce a bill that if anyone had more than $10,000 worth of crypto assets, right. they would have to declare it when they crossed the border. Mm -hmm. And it got resoundingly voted down, probably because they didn't, no one understood what it was about. Mm. But it was an interesting one because it was in, trying to go to that point of halting money laundering by mm. putting in barriers, but it didn't make any sense because people were saying, well, what are you gonna do? You have to say to people, do you give us your wallet addresses and yeah. we'll check the balance and check the price and is it actually over 10,000 <laughs> or not? It sounds ridiculous, except of course in the US now that they're, they're able to ask you for your yeah. phone and logins for all your social accounts. Yeah. That's what they've been talking about doing. They bought, when you're crossing borders, they're saying, log in. Give us your information. So several clients of mine only go to the US with what's you know colloquially called burner phones that are just really simple old phones that don't have access to Facebook and things. So if they say, give us your phone, you go, here you go. And there's nothing on it, which is the slightly paranoid people. <laughs> but we only have a few, a few minutes left for final questions. So if I might have you first, if that's uh, right. Do you believe that there is anything really uh, that is anonymous? Because say, for example, the recent High Court case with the um, public servants and the ability to sack public servants because of political opinion. Person concerned had an anonymous Twitter account, and that the um, High Court ruling indicated that the anonymity didn't actually matter. And so, in reality, when we're posting things, we believe we're being anonymous. Do you think that there really is that level of protection? Not in not in public blockchains as we know them, because um, when, whenever people talk about oh, it's used for money laundering and 
I had someone from uh, Scotia Bank on a panel recently who said it's you know it's the worst system for, for transactions that you never want people to know about mm -hmm. using a blockchain because it's permanent and forever. Mm -hmm. And if you identify one side of the transaction, you might be able to then identify the other one more easily. And there are these companies, Chain Analysis is a big one, mm -hmm. who's just trying to identify all the wallets against names for whatever people want to buy that information for. So it's yeah, it's not a good system for anonymity. There's a class called privacy coins. And we'll, we'll know the government properly understands blockchain when privacy coins are banned. <laughs> yes, that's coming. <laughs> because they are designed in a way with these things called zero knowledge proofs yeah. that make it um, possible to do transactions without knowing who the other party is or leaving a record on the, on the public blockchain. So they're very interesting in privacy protection, but the flip side is, of course, they're attractive with criminals or whatnot. Now, we're, we've only got two minutes, and there was one more question over there, but while the question's coming in, we did have some feedback, your final usage of this software, which I wanted to get some feedback to give to the organisers. So do you want to ask a question while some others started doing their ratings? Yeah, sure. Um, were you guys surprised? You guys have been in this, doing this for quite a long time. Have you been surprised over the last, how we have 20 or so years when social media as a thing started to happen, just how um, how willing people were to go give their data away. I remember um, sort of we'd been a software development where every you know, man's dog was trying to write some sort of social media thing and, oh, why don't we just get something that goes through and scans emails and checks through stuff. And we thought, no, no one would ever be so stupid as to give their, a third party their username and password. Um, and that was exactly what Facebook did in the early days. Do these sorts of things still surprise you guys? No, because I have that economics view of the, pri the value of privacy and, and the value of data. And also, running a tech startup back in, in, doc in the dot-com days, we ran a little thing once you know, before people encrypted databases as a matter of course, and we went, look at all these Hotmail addresses coming in. And my business <laughs> partner went, ah, oh, I just picked four of them at random, and the password they used for our one was their email password. <laughs> and I went, well, number one, I hope you've logged out of all those, because that sounds somewhat illegal. <laughs> But number two, wow, that's really stupid that they, that people just assumed random um, girl who sang the song at the Olympics, was it Nikki Webster? Yep. Yeah, Nikki Webster website would totally look after my information and not leak it. Now, that was never, you know, we encrypted it after that, but we were probably one of the early people encrypting all our databases because we went, you know, liability issues if this got lost and people's emails were getting hacked. But having seen how readily people hand over that information, it doesn't surprise me at all that people are happy to do it now. And it turns out, Chainalysis did an examination of dark web transactions, and it, re it turned out that most people doing illegal transactions on Bitcoin in the early days took almost no steps to hide their whole trails of money. So they can go back and try and tie in ownership of data. And there's a couple billion dollars in Bitcoin in so-called dirty wallets that are watched all the time to see if anyone's going to move it out because they're tied in and associated with drug dealing. And so they can't really go anywhere because people will get busted if they move out to any identified wallets. Yeah. I think everyone's a genius with the benefit of hindsight. I, I get that a lot. Um, Facebook, when they IPO'd, um, said we don't have a model uh, yet for making money on mobile. So they didn't know. Well, that was the desktop version. So the reality is it's all moved so quickly um, that uh, I don't think a lot of people saw it coming. All right. Well... Some of you have done ratings. Thank you so much. If the last few could, it would be very um, much appreciated. But if you could all put your hands together to thank my excellent panel today, Brian, Steve, and Peter. And I hope we've answered any of your questions. You can find us all probably on LinkedIn. It's probably pretty yes. easy to locate. We've given our data to LinkedIn. I hope you enjoyed today and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. And Michael, thank you so much for um, leading the questions through the panel. Um, Joining you once again and thanking our panel.